Six episodes into Star Trek Discovery, the crew is finally beginning to gel. But all is not well in the Trek universe. Sarek James Frain, father of Spock and guardian of Michael Burnham's Inequa Martin Green, is in distress, setting off the events of Episode 6, Lethe. Spoiler alert this article includes plot details of Star Trek Discovery. Turn back now if you haven't watched the series' sixth episode. Captain Lorca Jason Isaacs takes the latest addition to his lethal menagerie for a spin LT. Ash Hyler Shazad Latif bests the captain while shooting up a holodeck-generated Klingon threat during training. After accepting the position of security chief from Lorca, Tyler goes to the mess hall and runs into cadet Sylvia Tilly Mary Wiseman and Burnham, who doesn't make it through her breakfast burrito before entering an altered state as Sarek mentally reaches out to her across vast distances of space. Finding and retrieving her lost and critically wounded foster father becomes Burnham's sole mission, and she brings Lorca, Tyler, Tilly, the rest of the Discovery crew, and even visiting Admiral Cornwell Jane Brooke on her journey. This trek unleashes powerful memories in Sarek and feelings that will no doubt reverberate through the entire series. We got an early peek at Lethe and spoke to Frain recently seen as Theo Gallivan and Gotham and Latif Dr. Jekyll and Penny Dreadful about the different emotional journeys their respective characters are on and how much more great drama we can expect from them over the rest of the season. James Frain Shazad Latif Spock's father Sarek faces the wrath of his ward photo by James Dimmick Debbie Day for Raw on Tomatoes Sarek is such an icon in the whole of the Star Trek franchise. How did you feel about taking on this character James Frain? I was really excited to be part of this. It's been an incredible experience, and straight away, I was like, I would love to. Absolutely. People ask me if I'm intimidated by the character in the original series. I'm not, really. I made a point of watching Mark Leonard's performance, which I think is terrific. It is also very specific to its time. It's the guy that Sarek ends up as. I thought it was really interesting to track back from that and go, well, how did he get there? What's beneath all that? We know that he's married a human. What happened there? He married a human? That's crazy. Do other Vulcans do that? We find out, in this episode, that he's considered to be right outside the box. I mean, there are terrorists who've tried to kill Michael. Sarek saves her by giving her a piece of his soul, we find out in this episode. Then, there are terrorists trying to kill him, right now. That's what's happening. She's in his mind, the martial arts, and the Vulcans, all that kind of stuff. In his memories, what's happening is he's dying from a suicide bomber. All that's happening because he has this progressive idea of integration between humans and Vulcans, and also other species. He's very much committed to that. All of those things, the writers have blown up the whole thing of, who was Sarek, and how did we get here we still, I feel like, we're asking questions more than we're giving answers, sometimes, because there's so much to find out. It's a lot of fun. RT has it even been stated in Discovery yet that Sarek has been the ambassador to the humans, that, that's how Sarek has a human wife Frain no. It's been explicitly stated that. He's a high-ranking diplomat and ambassador, and therefore would be at the center of Starfleet and would be at the center of, just like the United Nations. He's the UN ambassador, basically. There's more to look at there. There's so much story there to tell. These characters are so dynamic and fascinating. It's so interesting how much more you can discover, the more you dig. R.T. Sarek is not the typical Vulcan, because he's open to all of this chaos that is humanity. Do you think that was part of his personality, previously, or do you think that he's, because of the diplomatic role that he found himself in, that he became open to that frame? I don't know that we've really nailed that down. I think it's quite open. I think that, generally, all of us have a tension and dynamic between different parts of ourselves. The people we would like to be, the people we were raised as, and the people that we are. Sarek has all of those things. He has a particularly wide range. But also, he was brought up within a very strict, honor code society. He's kind of like a samurai, in that sense. He can't just step away from that. Also, as we know, being a diplomat doesn't guarantee you stop wars happening. People go to the UN all the time trying to negotiate between parties who then just go off to war with each other. It's not like he's idealistic, or ignorant about how difficult it is, but I think he does have a vision of Starfleet as where we should all be heading. This idea of species purity is only going to end in violence, as it's already begun in violence. It's the Klingons code. It's the code of the terrorists. It's the code of the people who tried to kill Michael and Sarek. It's destructive, and pointless. He sees that, and I think it's his capacity to imagine, and to go that one step further, that makes him essentially a great ambassador, but also, potentially, a trouble for the Vulcan elites. R.T. Wright
I don't want to get too political, Frain just do it RT but it's so timely, what you're describing, the topic of people who are accepting of other cultures and people who are not. But Star Trek has a long history of that. Frain Star Trek was always forward thinking in its vision of humanity. It was always designed to be progressive, in that sense. It always had echoed things that were happening in the wider society, but in a very positive way. In fact, I think this continues in that tradition. Those things are true, whether it's being acted out on the public stage or not. This idea of purity is a really, really dangerous one. It has a really destructive history, and it can only lead to violence. There's no such thing. To watch these characters in fiction grapple with that, and struggle with that, I think is a great kind of way of mirroring back to us what we're kind of struggling with, out here. RT even in Vulcan culture, where they're supposed to be so advanced to the point that they were the human's first contact, there is still this fringe element that has a very narrow view of what it is to be Vulcan, frame the irony as well as that here is this group of people claiming to act logically, but in fact, acting with extreme passion. There is, in the prehistory of the Vulcans, the sort of root story is that they were, in fact, a very emotional race or species, it's described as both, in the series, which is interesting, but there was a nuclear war, on their home planet. It was catastrophic, and there were survivors determined that they nearly destroyed themselves because of out-of-control passions therefore, they had to build a society based on dispassionate logic. It doesn't mean that they don't feel things. It means that they place a very high value on acting rationally, and communicating, rationally, and deliberating, rationally, and not bringing emotions into all of that. I suspect one of the things that the Vulcans are nervous about, in dealing with the humans, is here is this passionate species. The Klingons here is this extremely volatile, emotional society. That must be something that's frightening to the core of who the Vulcans are. Sarek's playing in some dangerous territory. I think he would say, this is the way it is, and there's only one way forward. Better practice your SUUs mana, Sarek. Star Trek Discovery picked out Twitter.com for a Bregu 4L, Star Trek Discovery It's Star Trek OBS October 23, 2017 RT That brings me to a few questions, specifically, about Sunday's episode Sarek is dying, and he's still engaging in this emotional standoff with Michael, and he doesn't even recognize that's what it is until the very end. He's feeling a lot. Would that be correct to say, Freyan, yeah? I mean, there's a great reveal, when I think Shazad's character, Tyler, who says to Michael, the kind of thing that goes through your mind, when you're about to die, is the kind of thing that you regretted. Your deepest regret. What is his deepest regret? What would he had liked to do differently? That's the key for her to then get in. Then, he lets her in. He decides to show her. The fact of that is so powerful, but it's also all happening in his mind. It's like, well, how much of that is going to stay? I think he's clearly feeling a lot, and he confesses. He feels a tremendous sense of shame. It's clearly something he regrets. He feels like he's failed her. He tells her, I failed you. He tells her, in episode 2, I failed you. He tells her twice in this, I failed you. He carries a sense of guilt and shame. But he's been put in an impossible position. I feel kind of empathetic towards him for that. RTO, absolutely. WASNT at Michael who said Sarek was feeling shame frame, yeah? She gives him the language, cause he can't do it, and he says yes. She's saying, look, what you're talking about, I think, is called shame. I'm learning these things from my human experience. Now, I'm educating you, on your deathbed. I can't save you until you make peace with this. It's fascinating. It's brilliant. RT it's great writing. Frayne it's brilliant writing, I think. RT the father, at the end of the episode, would that have been the first time that Michael Burnham would have used that word with him? Frayne yes. That's interesting. RT it was very powerful. He's going to have to answer for his actions. Frayn, yeah? I think at that moment, he's just so overwhelmed, and vulnerable, I don't think he feels safe enough to go to that place, at that moment. RT, that's a great insight. I would not have thought of that, but thank you for revealing that. But, yeah, I did not envy him, with the promise that was loaded into the way that she said that. I did not envy him at all. Frayn, but it's also, she has a right to it. Then, later on, she says she realizes she's never going to get from him what she wants. She's at peace with that. That's also interesting, because does she really mean that? Is that really true? We don't know. RT now they're on the ship together, I know you can't reveal spoilers, but I just assume that he will be convalescing for a time, and that they would be spending more time for that reveal to happen. You have more episodes that are going to run, right Freyan, yeah? There's quite a lot ahead. I can't really flag any of that. It's designed to be intriguing, and so I have to maintain the intrigue. RT I appreciate that you do. 
I'm looking forward to seeing how Sarek interacts with the rest of the crew and the captain, and, yeah, I'm so eager to see more of your character. I'm very excited for you, too, as an actor. Frayn, yeah? It's a gift of a role, and I'm really enjoying it. James Frayn Shazad Latif, page 2 New to Discovery, former POW LT. Ash Tyler quickly finds his place LT. Tyler is on a different emotional path than Ambassador Sarek. Having just broken free of captivity, he seems sincerely grateful for Lorca's offer of a position on the Discovery. Of course, if Lorca sees everyone and everything around him as a tool for war and or his own revenge, Tyler, very likely more fragile from his imprisonment and sex slavery than he appears on the surface, may be in for more than he bargained for. In Lethe, Lorca charges Tyler with Burnham's safety and return. Longer term, however, Burnham may have a stronger case for the role of caretaker. Photo by Jan Thidshub's Debbie Day for Raw on Tomatoes When we met him, the last week's episode, that he was essentially a sex slave on a Klingon ship, Shazad Latifia. RT are we going to see more emotional repercussions of that captivity Latif? Yes. Well see that unfold more, how certain things might trigger stuff, and make him have to deal with these kind of things, yeah? RT because between last week's episode and the upcoming episode, he's been sort, in survival mode and adjusting to these new characters that he's involved with. But I feel like there's an undercurrent that we haven't quite seen entirely yet. Latif, yes. It's bubbling under, and there are things that could easily boil over onto the surface, which we're going to see as we go along. Because if you've been through things like, if you've been tortured, if you've been in a pow, there are little triggers that can set you off. And yeah, we'll see stuff like that throughout the series. RT could say a little bit about when Harry Mudd was talking about Lorca's background, like what would have been going through your character's mind at the time Latif when he tells about what Lorca did to the Buren if any soldier heard that a captain had blown up his crew, it's just a shocking thing to hear, especially for a soldier. For anyone, but for a soldier to hear that a senior officer would do that, it's a hard thing to take. But maybe he could understand why, and understand the courage of that decision. And he respected it. And I think it was a conflict of both those things. You have respect, and fear, and shock. R-T-I-D-I-D and T really understand the story. So much how was the captain in a position to blow up his own ship at Survive Latif, yeah? Did he explain how he got off the ship? I can't remember now, how he got off the ship, yeah? Good question. I don't know. R-T-I expect that it will be coming out over the course of the season. Well hear more about exactly how it went down, but I just thought, his eyes were damaged, really where was he standing there were some hints at New York Comic Con that Michael Burnham is going to get a love interest. Is Ash going to be that love interest can you say Latif there's definitely some chemistry there. Yeah, we're going to see how things play out. He's, they spend a lot of time together. RT that brings us to this episode things move very quickly for Ash. One minute he's playing with Lorca's toys, which was really a test, right Latif, yeah? He's testing to see if he's in the right mind state to take on a challenge. He knows he can do it, but it's just what a captain has to do just to make sure. RT and then he very quickly gets a position on the ship. He's got nowhere to go, is that what essentially that scene is telling us Latif? If you go through like an incident like that with someone, you shared that intense experience with someone, and they are both in desperate situations, they use their skills to get away. Lorca knows he's qualified, but also there's a bond there. For Tyler, Lorca is that another captain figure, who had lost on his other ship, and is a father figure. It's all of those things directly than one really. And maybe Lorca thinks, oh, I can use this guy. RT you've had a lot of scenes with Jason Isaac so far, how's it been acting with him Latif as a young actor, he's a hero of mine. I've grown up watching his movies. I remember first seeing him, me and my brother used to be interested in Armageddon when we were like 10 years old. He was the MIT guy. He's just been great ever since, and I've grown up with him performing, and now I'm interacting with him all the time. He's such a detective, he's so on point, and he's so open, and we just try things. Great actor and a great person. RT with Sunday's episode, you now have a lot of scenes with Sinequa Martin Green, how's that going Latif it's great. Again, she's such an open person, and I just love being able to go to work knowing that I could just relax into it, let go, and don't worry about if the other person, they're just very open people. We can try things out and just listen to each other, and we had a very nice work environment. I enjoyed time between action and cut very much, and that's a joy for an actor. RT just thinking more about the episode, when you're on the shuttle with Sinequa, there are a lot of special effects going on there. Have you had a lot of opportunity to work with that level of effects Shazad? No, not at all. 
It's my first experience with lots of green screen, and you just have to use your imagination a lot, and it's not a big set, but I thought it was going to be more green screen. I mean, we do have such great sets and things, so that you're in these worlds, and it's a lot easier to imagine, because everything has been done with such great budgets and also such detail. RT were you a fan of Star Trek before you got this gig Latif I W A S N T a super fan at all, no, but my granddad and my uncle Bern, my mom's cousin, he was a very big fan. He used to record like every episode, and I phoned him as soon as I could. But yeah, I had to become a fan. It was always on in the background, you know, like BBC 2 at 630, I can't remember, early 2000s, 90s must have been the 90s or 2000s, Patrick Stewart and Next Generation, and yeah I had to become a fan. I'm a fan now. RT can you explain how you got the role? What went down Latif? I did a take with my mother in the kitchen, who is actually in the kitchen right now. We just sent the tape off I suppose like the day before, and I ended up just directing her more. I think she's a great actress actually. I want my mom to be in telly. She's really good. And then we did a seven-week Skype audition, and I had to get some notes outside at a jazz club. My friend was doing this gig, this guy called Jack Tyson Charles, this really good funk and soul singer, and I had to be in this gig, and I could only the receive the notes on that day. I had to leave the club and get these notes stuck in my ear on a really loud London street with police sirens and that kind of stuff. And it was very hilarious. And luckily I didn't have to fly out for like one day. It's great. It worked out. Star Trek Discovery streams Sundays at 8.305.30 p.m. ETPT on CBS Alassis. James French is Latif.